Hi everybody, Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. You can find us at afterlifetv.com. This is where we search for evidence of life after death and ask the meaningful questions around that subject. Today, one of the more popular subjects uh, of Afterlife TV viewers, we're going to talk about near-death experiences, particularly the near-death experience of Dr. Lonnie Leary. Uh, for those of you who are longtime fans of Afterlife TV, you might recognize uh, Lonnie, she, we interviewed her uh, the first time, I don't know how long ago that was, but um, about this particular book and the work that she does, I'm going to try to get that there in your frame, No One Has to Die Alone. I remember last time I said, no one has to die. <laughs> I got that wrong. Uh, no one has to die alone. Preparing for a meaningful death. Uh, you know, this book, is, this book really is for everyone. And, and, and the reason is because each one of us is going to die. Each one of us knows someone who's going to die. Uh, we may actually experience the, the dying process with some of those people. And uh, in an, half the book is about uh, that process. And I'm going to, the part one of it, there's a part one and a part two. And part one, I think this is important. That's why I'm saying it is about making a difference through illness, dying, and death. And then part two is after the person has passed, making a difference through bereavement. This book covers it all. Uh, I recommended last time that everybody go out, grab a book, read it, buy a copy for every one of their loved ones. And some people actually did that and said what a difference it made. It brought up this conversation about death and dying. So we're going to welcome her back, Dr. Lonnie Larry. Thanks for coming back to Afterlife TV. Thank you. My pleasure to be with you. I'll tell you, you know, I remember, you know, last time it was towards the end uh, of the interview. And I said, you know, we got to bring you back and talk about your near-death experience. And, and here we are. We're doing that finally. Love it. Yeah. Yes. I'm excited about it. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about your work. Uh, well, I think I talked about it a little bit in the first interview. Um, I do this work, um, I was led to this work early because my mother died when I was 13. And it was such a profound and life-changing experience for me. And the grief was so um, overwhelming and unanswered that in order to cope, I had to find some meaning. I had to make meaning out of it. And so I vowed, I remember clearly at the age of 13, saying to myself that something good was going to come of this. And so I spent, um, you know, my formative years learning everything that I could about death, dying, and grief in order to understand my own process, but also to be able to pass that on and touch others so that their, the dying would be different and the grief would be different. I never wanted anyone else to feel the kind of um, profound confusion and despair that I did as I was grieving. Um, so I did go uh, back to graduate school and uh, earned my PhD in uh, counseling and psychology and specifically did all my work around death and dying and then uh, developed a um, program in death studies and taught that and have uh, really I've been taught by thousands of others as they were dying what was important to them so I worked in um, nine hospices across the United States and was with patients um, and their families as they were going um, through that transition. And they, they were really um, my teachers, my mentors, um, showing me, being so generous, really, and letting me into the most intimate and vulnerable time of their life. And um, I pass on what they taught me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what I love about this, because uh, we'll transition into you telling us about your near-death experience, and, and it sort of comes full circle right back to where you just started, because the near-death experience then really allowed you to connect with these people um, as, yes. as they were going through the dying process in a way that if you had not had it, you wouldn't have been able to connect with a lot of them, right? I think that I would have, I certainly would have been able to connect with the grief. Yeah. And of course, we grieve before we die. That's called anticipatory grief. But as a person is dying, many, many things are being lost. Roles are being lost. Physical strength is being lost. Sometimes relationships are lost. Hope um, for future dreams can be lost. So I would have been able to connect with them about their grief. Um, but 
but I what the the near death experience changed for me was that there wasn't any fear on my part of being with people as they were dying because there is nothing to fear because death is such an illusion i didn't need to talk about my experience with um most people who were dying because there was just a sense of um ability there was an ability to be with them in a way that really communicated there's nothing to be afraid of yeah 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 well, and, and they have experiences, um, spiritual, whatever yes. you want to call them, otherworldly yes. experiences as well, and uh, uh, that you were able to sort of relate to because of this near-death experience. Well, uh, and I was able to validate for them. Yeah. Because so many people feel as though they're crazy when they're seeing uh, deceased loved ones in the room with them, and the family members don't have the same experience of that and it's it's difficult to validate and support that and uh, to be able to be told um of course they're here for you yeah of course you're seeing them um is one of the most comforting things in the world for a person who's dying but also afterward i was able to have conversations with people who were grieving the, the death of their loved one. And I would ask open, um, direct questions such as, have you had an experience of your loved one since they've died? And most people's response to me, I mean, I would say 86% of people respond in such a way that says, thank you, thank you for asking me, because no one will talk to me about this experience, and I know I heard their voice, or I know I felt their touch on my cheek. And um, again, to be able to validate for that person is one of the most comforting, calming, reassuring things that we can do for someone who's in grief yeah and, and nowadays you know it's i think i think there's more and more people who are opening up to this sort of thing and and a little bit have greater awareness more doctors and nurses and that sort of thing but yes. but how long you've been doing this work oh 30 years yeah so you've seen it when boy i mean it was a little bit taboo to even discuss it right Oh, it was very taboo, and you can imagine being, you know, a uh, psychologist and a professor and talking about these experiences was, it was pretty risky yeah. in the early days. I, I had to be very careful of, uh, you know, really discern who was uh, ready or open to exploring this. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. I was just reading recently uh, a, a little bit about Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross and her experience, and yes. and and how uh, she actually wanted to talk about um, an experience that she had uh, that in, in the in the back of her famous book on death and dying, and mm -hmm. that you know she was talked out of it um, oh, because yeah. she figured nobody would ever publish it if if she had. Right, and when she did speak about it, she was very discredited. And and, and, and you know, I, it was funny because they were talking about like this was the fall of Doctor mm -hmm. Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Exactly. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. You know, I was like, man, this woman has courage. I never thought of it that way. But from an academic place, and and and, and certainly in terms of science and everything, I can see how that was their view of it. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. and you and you you were probably much more aware of it. Uh, you were aware of it, you know, while this stuff was going on, I imagine. I was aware of what? Uh, what What was going on with her at that time? I mean, you were probably more aware of it than I, I certainly was. Oh, yeah. In fact, I was down in one of the hospices um, in Virginia when she was there. And, it, it, yeah, I mean, people were, uh, she was trying to do very, very important work with children with AIDS. And um, she was, you know, they wanted to boot her out of town. Ah, it was very sad. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, um, a, little, a less risky, yeah. <laughs> living in a less risky time for you to be able to tell your story. Uh, let's do it. Um, I know this all started with a dentist visit. Who, yes. who knew, right? Who could have yes. expected that? A dentist visit. Tell us, tell us about your near-death experience, how it started, and what took place. Yeah. Well, I was going for a routine um, dental procedure, and um, I was uh, almost 29 years old happily married and had a beautiful um, <clears throat> two and a half year old baby and just took myself to the dentist for a regular procedure and I was in the dentist chair and given nitrous oxide, laughing gas, yep. 
And uh, the first the first thing I knew, I was lying back in the dentist chair. And the next thing I knew, I was up in the corner of the room looking down at my inert body. And I felt no fear. I felt no anxiety. Um, and as I looked at my body, I really felt a fondness for it. I, I knew this body, but I knew that I was not that body. And um, I felt no, uh, I felt a, an old familiarity with it, but as though it was ready to be tossed off and go to the Salvation Army. Wow. It was well, it was well used and well loved. Um, but I didn't need it back. I didn't want it back. But the, the dentist was frantically working on me, and I was trying to communicate. I was trying to talk to the dentist. The yeah. dentist didn't hear me. And um, I, I just looked at my body with kind of a, 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 a fond detachment. And I had no sense of time, so I don't know how long I was up there in the corner of the room. Yeah. But the next thing that I was aware of was that I was entering a tunnel, and my mother, who had been dead for 15 years, was right at the entrance to the tunnel with her arms out. Oh. And she was whole and she was beautiful, vibrant, and uh, healed. She was healed. And that was really important because she did not die whole and vibrant and um, you know, thriving in this way. Yeah. And I saw her and I knew it was her and I went into her and um, I was not able to say goodbye um, when she died. She died suddenly and unexpectedly. And um, I communicated with her telepathically. So it was as though I thought and she received yeah. and she thought and I received. I heard it inside of this being, whatever this I was now, right. and I said to her, I love you, and she said, I know, in such a way that the energy went around me like her arms, and I said, I miss you, and she said, I know, <clears throat> and what I knew, what I knew in that communication was that all those things every single day of my life that I had wanted to tell her or I had wanted to ask her, I already had. What I knew is that she had always been with me and there had never been any separation between us. And I knew that she knew that I loved her. Mm. And all those years I had felt so guilty that I had not been able to say goodbye. And I was 13 years old and a typical teenager, you know, wanting distance and independence and... Um, I had felt so guilty as though um, really there was a part of my 13-year-old brain that uh, felt so um, just, oh, despair doesn't even come close to it, but as though uh, she had died believing that her only daughter didn't love her because I had told her that. So in this moment of communication, that was healed. Uh. And I knew that she would always be with me. And I still know that. I know that now. I know she's right here. So the next thing um, I was aware of was that I was going into this tunnel and I had to go to this through this tunnel because at the, I could see a speck of light and it was as though I was a magnet and I was drawn to this light. There was no question that I was going toward it. And I was in this tunnel that was so beautiful and magnificent. It, it, as I close my eyes now, I can see it and feel it. And it was an opalescent blue, like there was mother of pearl all around this tunnel. Mm. And as I went through this tunnel, I heard the most magnificent music. And I went closer and closer to the light. And the light got bigger and bigger and brighter, as though I was looking at the sun, but there was no pain in looking at this light. And I was in front of the light. And then I was aware that I that the light was all around me, just like my mother's arms. And then I was in the light and I was the light. Mm. As though there was no separation between a drop of water and the ocean. It yeah. was one and the same. Yeah. And I knew I was home. I was home. And I, I really, I experienced, I felt, and I knew a love um, with a capital L that I had never experienced um, 
on earth, this unconditional love so that I knew that I was forgiven for anything I thought I couldn't be forgiven for. Wow. Um, I was one in the same. I belonged. Um, and I was loved beyond measure. Mm. And I wanted to be there. Yeah. And the next thing I was aware of was that the light, and you can call the light whatever you want because it is beyond name. Um, the light said to me in the same way that my mother and I communicated, mm. you must go back. And I yelled with whatever force I had, no! <laughs> and the light said again, you have work to do. You must go back. And I still yelled, no! And then I felt myself churning back through this tunnel, almost like I was in a blender. And I can say it was, it was uh, emotionally, physically, my experience was that it was almost you know, painful to come back. And then the next thing I knew, I was back in the dentist chair. Oh, and, that, and my I, life changed. I bet it did. And, and tell me, I, you know, I, I, how did the dentist react? Is, I just find it kind of curious. Yeah. Well, this was uh, back in, you know, 1981, 82. And um, uh, the dentist, I, I think that the dentist believed, we didn't talk about it. The dentist believed that he had resuscitated me. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and he just wanted to make sure that I, I, I was able to drive home. <laughs> yeah. And I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure he had ever had that experience before. And certainly I hadn't. I'd never spoken with anyone who had that experience. I didn't have the language. Right. And so I didn't talk about it for years and years afterward. Although my husband knew immediately that something had happened to me. Oh, he did. How, how did uh, he know? I don't know. Just by. Oh, he just knew. He, uh, something had shifted. Something had. Well, yeah. And, yeah. and and some things had changed for you in terms of uh, there were things about your life that you just decided to do differently. I'm I'm not even sure I decided. I just knew they had to be different. <laughs> it, in the same way that I had to go toward the light, um, my life was going to be different. Though I didn't really understand how. You know, I had received this message that I had work to do. I didn't have a clue what that meant. Yeah. And there was a there was a sense when I got back of 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 um, that this, I remember saying to myself or out loud, this better be good, you know, because I'm missing out on being there. And it, it wasn't that I didn't want to be here. And certainly it wasn't that I didn't want to be with my family, my child, my husband. Um, but I didn't know what could be more important than being in the midst of that love. Yeah. And so when I came back, it was shortly, it was a couple months afterward that I remember clearly um, reading the morning newspaper, turning the page and seeing a full page article about hospice and the word, or again, the energy just came up off the page and it was a big yes. And I knew instantly that that's what I was to do. Mm. And I took myself into a local hospice and said, um, I am to work here. Okay. And I've been, I've been doing that work ever since. Really? And how do they respond? You know, I, I, I it, there are people um, who are there um, always in our path to um, help us do what we're to do. And when I took myself in, the hospice nurse that interviewed me, she made it happen. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't understand. Uh -huh. well, I, it sort of goes along, you know, people you can call it intuition, your gut, gut mm -hmm. feeling, whatever. When you follow that, life just seems to flow, doesn't it? It does. It does. When you really listen to that voice inside. Yeah. yeah, and and when we ignore it, is when we often run into obstacles, mm -hmm. uh, because we're trying to make something happen that right. maybe isn't supposed to happen or right. just isn't the right time. Right. Uh, all right. Let's dissect your story a little bit. Uh, that's not you covered a lot, and uh, so I'm going to ask some questions. Maybe sure. maybe you'll have answers to these. Maybe you won't. Mm -hmm. um, but 
what I love, you know, what I love about your particular near-death experience is it has all the elements of your typical near-death experience, right? I mean, there was you hovering in the ce- over the ceiling, going through the tunnel, you know, being greeted by loved ones on the other side. It it, it, a lot of a lot of the typical stages, and yet with any near-death experiences, uh, there near-death experience, each one is different. You know, each one is unique in itself, yes. and yes. a lot of it, I think, you know, has to do with your own interpretation and your own interpretation is based on your belief systems, you know, you know, all this sort of thing, what you're expecting to happen. And, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a shock to you that you're even there. Um, but, uh, each person seems to be a little different for whatever that really reason, that reason really is. And, and so I like to sort of ask some of the same questions to people, uh, in these interviews to sort of find out what their answer would be to it. Now, you know, so often we all hear about hovering, hovering up at, at the ceiling. We now yeah. you didn't actually. Did you experience leaving your body? It sounds like you just were there. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's an important point. Um, I did not experience any of the trauma of my heart stopping. Yeah. I think that's a really important piece. And when I work with people in, in particularly hospice, but when I work with people, when I work with the families of people who are dying, yeah. it is important to know that what we see and experience of, a, of our loved one, uh, perhaps even the death rattle or um, looking as though they're agitated, what we see is not necessarily what they experience. And that's a really important point because I experience no pain, no anxiety, no trauma in the moment of death. Right. And it's not even, you know, there's no part of that that's a memory for me. Yeah. And the other thing that's ex- important is yes, I was still in the room after my heart stopped. And so I try to keep the room of the person who's dying very serene. Um, I want to say low drama, um, but just really a very sacred space. And to um, continue to uh, relate and connect with the loved one. And so to talk to the person as though they're still in the room. Yeah, right. Because I was in the room. And then the other thing is that is the the thing uh, that I didn't have a an ownership of my body. Mm. It was just a vehicle. It was an old car. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I I'm grateful for the body that I inhabited and I used it well, but it's not who I was. Yeah. It's not who I am now. Yeah, and, and, what, and what's interesting is, you know, I mean, you're only 29 years old, so, and you you sort of referred to it earlier about, you know, sort of being, you know, worn out, like kind of, like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, it had been through a lot, obviously, it had been through a lot, but that was the way you were perceiving it as, mm-hmm. you know, boy, this this body's been through a lot, right? Yeah, and, and really how different it would be uh, for us as loved ones to look at this body and just to be grateful for it. Yeah. And and I want to say that's that's what the deceased are also feeling. Yeah. Just thank you, thank you. And what a, how different we can make that experience if we come at it from that perspective. That's right. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And 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 even as you're observing it, like you said, you're you're observing. You know, the body's going through something. He, the doctor, the dentist is trying to resuscitate you. You know, you're, but you're not feeling any of that. I'm not you're, feeling it. The spirit has left the body, um, and and not experienced any of this. And I was like, so you're so you're hovering up at the ceiling, and we hear this all the time up at the ceiling. Uh, so many often times I hear <laughs> they're in the corner of the room. Were you in the corner? Or were you, whereabouts were you in the ceiling? My experience was that, that I was up in the corner of the room. Oh yeah, but, and I hear yeah. this. I don't know why that is, but whatever. I, I um, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. One of those question questions we might never have answered. But you're up there. Uh, I know that you explained how you felt about your body. Uh, I had read something that you wrote um, that you also felt something for the dentist and you felt some a lot of compassion for him and something that either you 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 said and was transcribed or that you wrote, which was in your book. I'm not sure, but you actually seem to feel more compassion for him. Yes, because he was so 
Oh, he was scared and agitated, and I was really trying to communicate, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's okay, it's all okay. Isn't that beautiful? And he couldn't, you know, receive it. No, right, and now some Which people... Which isn't, but, but I just, I want to add that too, that I think that there is so much communication to us, and I think that we might block it because of either our grief, yeah. our fear... Our, our agitation. And so there is help coming to us. Yeah. But be, just because we can't perceive it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So no fear at all during this, this no. hovering no. experience. No fear and no shock, Bob. So you had used the word shock. I felt yeah. no shock that I was there. I felt more of a wonder that and and uh, again gratitude and this is so beautiful and really almost kind of an adventure yeah. like wow I get to go to Europe for the first time <laughs> yeah. I love that um, well this is I mean great I mean a wonderful peaceful experience and then there's that transition to the tunnel now how about that uh, just like you explained about your body you just seem to be at at the in the corner of the ceiling uh how about the transition to the tunnel was there any kind of a transition experience or are you just sort of there i i yes i was aware i was there and i was at the you know the it, it felt to me like the entrance of the tunnel and my mother was right at the entrance of the tunnel to catch me it felt like she was there to catch me as though her arms were open wide and it was a peaceful landing i might say yeah um but you know right into the bosom of your mother you know um <sighs> What else could you, what else could I, it was so clearly um, a healing moment for me. Yeah. Um, what I had needed for all those years. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. And, and you tell a great story in your book about one of the last confrontations, uh, confrontations, one of the conf oh. confrontations, but one of the last interactions that you had with your mother. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, it wasn't the most positive thing that you did uh, in terms of human perspective. Yes. Uh, obviously, we know from her spiritual perspective, it, she wasn't worried about it at all. Mm -hmm. But for the healing benefit to have this experience and, and, and to be able to communicate with her in the way that you did is amazing. Now, one of the things I love, and uh, our audience who are familiar with other videos uh interviews that i've done i i talk a, lo a lot about sometimes the past life experience um if mm. you've had a regression and you go through a past life and one of the things that i've uh always remembered it was amazing to me was that we have uh we have this we gain this knowing and so even when i'm telling the regressionist about something that is taking place uh, there's so much more that i'm aware of and in your particular case you're talking about you know your mother you said three things to her, and three times she just said, I know, to you. And yet there was so much more communication around yes. that, right? Yes. I, I really felt as though I was downloaded with a wisdom that I can't even put into words. Yeah. And I felt that same way, um, downloaded with um, love and wisdom in the presence of this light. You knew all that, that you oh, needed to know from her. I did. And I, I, still, I still do. Um, uh, it, and it has... It's distilled into a presence rather than even a language. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love the sound of the bird in the background. Oh, it's beautiful. And the luscious uh, greenery behind you, I should let everybody know, I'm sitting with two feet of snow outside my door here in Maine, and you're in Hawaii. Right. We can see I'm what in it's heaven. like there. Yes. <laughs> the contrast um, mm -hmm. of life. Well, this is beautiful. So... Uh, now you're in the tunnel you you've had this experience with your mom you i know that um when it was time to leave her i know from other things that you somehow were ready to let her go talk talk about that and how like how can you explain that 
Well, yeah, it, it now that I would say is still surprising and it's surprising to my ego, my personality even now because before I had this experience if someone had said to me, if you could have any miracle in your life, what would it be? And it would be to see my mother again. And if they said to me, well, what would you say to her if you had this opportunity? My response would be, well, you know, do I have 15 years because I have 15 years worth of questions and experiences I want to share with her. I want to tell her about my first date and my marriage and my child. And I mean, so many, so many questions. So um, it's so surprising to me that when I did have the opportunity to be with her and to say anything, to ask anything, that I really only needed to say three things. And that was from the soul level, I think, not from the personality level, because again, what was downloaded was this wisdom of everything that you've needed to ask has been answered. Yeah. Everything that you've needed to know, you already know. Everything that you need to have confirmed is confirmed. That that kind of uh, that kind of deep knowing. Um, so uh, yes, it 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 took three exchanges to get what I needed, and then I what I knew is that to let go of my mother is that's an illusion. That that. She was. She had always been with me. She would always be with me, um, and so yes, it was just easy to let go. I because yeah, it wasn't that, a letting that, go. That's not quite even a, a, the accurate way to say it. But yeah, yeah. I I went to the light because I was pulled toward the light because I had to go. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, well, that's so. Let's go there. So. Interesting. Something else. Uh, you had given a talk once uh, for IANDS, right? Mm-hmm. Was that who it was for? And they transcribed it. Yes. And it was, they, you were telling a story, and you were talking about um, you were kind of going head first down this tunnel. It, that's what it felt like. Okay. And and, and <laughs> can you describe that? Because you know, at least my mind, and I imagine other people. You know, you're kind of like you're like this, <laughs> and uh, like you're just sort of hovering through. <laughs> Through this tunnel, I'm sure right. it wasn't like that. Right, it's, it's kind of like the Olympic toboggan experience of, of uh, it, 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 it. You know, it's it maybe is a better um, way of describing as saying it, that the orientation was. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Because, because really, you're being I, of light I now. I wouldn't say that I had a body. I didn't have a body. I had a, I had a perspective. I had an orientation. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay. That mm. and, and which is great. I mean, okay. I'm glad I asked that question because that explains a lot to us. Um, you're being drawn to it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people worry about, you know, someone passes. This is sort of a little bit of a traumatic event. This was, I mean, we don't know for sure, right? But you, you're assuming you were allergic to the gas that you were given. That's what I'm assuming. I. In my youth, I had never smoked, I never drank, I never took drugs, I didn't even take aspirin. I, I do not think it was the dentist's, you know, error. Yeah. Um, I had this sh- uh, shock reaction. I think my body just went, whoa, what is this? You yeah, know? right. Mm-hmm. So, you ha- so you have this experience. And, but some people worry about, you know, this, um, the, the inability, you know, this maybe getting lost or, you know, those sorts of things that people talk about. Your case, and, and many others that I've talked with who have had near-death experiences, it, it's, you, you don't need a map. No. You know, you're just drawn in yes. the direction that you're supposed to go. Yeah, you know, and actually that's a, that's a really good um, metaphor because we don't need a map. We just need to follow our heart. So the, I, I would say that the magnet was kind of heart-to-heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you're aware of the light at the end of the tunnel, the sort of. Oh, very aware. Aware of it, and what uh, the feelings that you had, and I'm going to ask you what those are in a moment. Well, you, whatever you can explain that now, but the feelings that you had from it, did, did, did they grow as you got closer to it? Um, the light grew as I got closer to it. So at, when I had just gone into the tunnel and, and let go of my mother, yeah. uh, you know, it was almost as though it was a speck of light. And then as I went through the tunnel, the light got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter. Um, and maybe that's a reflection of my feeling. 
Yeah. You know, did the tunnel get bigger and bro- bigger and bigger? Did the tunnel did the get t- bigger and bigger? No. What, that wasn't my experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, and so I just have to go back a little bit. Uh, so you leave your mother. Uh, I mean, did she, did, I know. I I understand this is hard to explain. Okay. Uh, but does she it's... seem like you sort of left her behind? She sort of stayed no. there. You went or. Oh. No, I didn't experience that she went with me. Yeah. But there was. See, here's the difference. When you when we use words like left behind. Yeah. The the feeling that's attached to that is maybe one of fear or anxiety. Yeah. There was not one. Fear isn't in the vocabulary at all here. Right. Okay. Right. So. Um, yeah. But I'm so I'm really thinking more in terms of um, placement. You know what I mean? So like if we were literally in a tunnel, okay, <laughs> like a train tunnel or something. You know, all right, mom, see you later, and I'm going <laughs> this way, and you you know you stay here. I don't know where you're going, but I'm going this way. You know, in terms of placement, any is there any even uh, comprehension of? I know there's no space, so is there any comprehension of that sort of thing, or is it just you're with her? Now you're not with her. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, <clears throat> the best way I can describe it is just an awareness. I, I was aware I was with my mother, yeah. and the next thing I was aware I was moving through the tunnel, yep. and the next thing I was aware that I was in this light and okay. of the same energy as this light. All right. Uh-huh. So that's where my focus is, you see? Yeah, and thank you for indulging me in all these silly questions. Oh, I don't think they're silly at all. I think we're all trying to, you know, uh, explore and, and make meaning of it. Um, I know that you're, at first you're, you're, you're in the arms of your mom, right? You're, you're, you're in the arms of her. Mm-hmm. Was, did that feeling ever go away? No, I... I, I no, it it is you know when people talk about going to their safe place, yeah, yeah, or they're meditating. Yeah. I can close my eyes and go right back to yeah. that experience. I can see it. I can feel it. Uh, it is so experiential, and uh, it, and so I'm in the arms of my mother, and I can feel that, and then I can feel being in the light. Yeah, and it's. I love that. I love it because uh, everybody agrees it's the same thing in their mind. They can just sort of go right back there. You know, it's that dream you had last night. You know, it's, you know, if you had it 30 years ago, it's just like you had it last night sort of thing. Um, You, so the light, you know, some people would call it God and source and we have all kinds of possible names. You say it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to call it, it's right. You call it the light. And you said at first, it, at first it was spatially in front of you, and then it was all around you, and then you were within it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm, there's not much more else you can say about that, is there? No, if, if you could imagine diving into the ocean and becoming liquid. Yeah. There, it, it, it's as though my skin didn't, you know, there was no separation between my skin my my water skin and and it there was just no separation can you imagine no separation oh. I, I i boy words just really limit uh limit me but yeah. um the experience of being immersed in love so yes you know sometimes i'll call it light sometimes i'll call it's liquid love but it's pure bliss doesn't even come close to it um yeah it but it's it's a tangible. Uh, I can feel it. And maybe one of the um, biggest challenges, probably for us humans, uh, as physical beings, is the rea- is not understanding the reality that we're we're we are that anyways. We're part yes. of that anyways all the time, but we can't right. feel it the way you felt it. Wouldn't you say that's one of the greatest challenges of the human condition, <laughs> the human experience? The human, the uh, yes, I think one of the greatest challenges is not believing this illusion. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That we are that we are limited, that we are separate. You know that that's the illusion that we are not loved, that we are not worthy and accepted. Um, to have uh, even a momentary experience of 
the illusion dropping, the separation dropping, and to really feel even for a moment how overwhelmingly loved we are um, changes you. When you're in the tunnel, you described it as uh, like a robin's egg blue. Is this? Is this yeah. And you said it was opaque. So I'm like, is this sort no, of translucent? It's, it's. It was not opaque. It was opalescent. Opalescent. If you, if you can imagine this kind of sparkly mother of pearl blue, mm. beautiful. Beautiful. And does it seem to go on and on and on type of a thing, or is there there is a, is there? It's like a wall type of thing. Uh, <laughs> Silly questions. Well, no, you want to experience it. I understand. Yeah. Um, I didn't touch it. I yeah. just, yeah. Was there a smell I, to it? Was there a smell, I, an odor? No, you know, I didn't smell. I didn't I didn't have that, that sense open yep. to me. Mm -hmm. yep. But I did hear. Right. And I heard this music that was just incredible. Um, and this is where you heard the music, or did the music continue throughout the whole thing? Um, I was, I, I would say I was aware of it in the tunnel. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. let's talk about that now. You got a, you found some music that r reminds yeah. you of it? Yes. Yeah, so, so th that was an interesting story. My husband and I were going into one of those nature stores and we we're walking in and all of a sudden he turns to me and says, what is wrong with you? And I, I'm not feeling any distress. I said, what, what, nothing. And he said, well, tear, big crocodile tears were rolling down my face. So I paused for a moment and I listened and I heard this music and it, it had just washed over me and, you know, triggered this response. Yeah. And I went up to the counter and I said, what is that music? And uh, she told me I bought it and I have been using it ever since for the past 30 years. Um, at, when I work with dying patients, when I'm doing some calming and healing exercises with them, and so, not surprisingly, the music is called Angels of Comfort. All right. So something just occurred to me. So we were going to play it, and I just, I just realized I put these on YouTube, and YouTube is like really against playing anybody else's music, okay? You have to oh, have all kinds shit. of rights and stuff. Let's yeah. just tell people how, how they could find this they could probably go on itunes or something yes. like that so it's called what's it called it, again it's called angels of comfort and the artist i'm probably going to butcher his name so uh forgiveness please but it's iasos which is spelled i-a-s-o-s -S. and I, I i i'm so sorry that we can't play this in the Me background too. because it uh, is so enveloping and uh almost as though you could just fall right into it yeah. All right. Well, that's great. And people, most people will know how to look that up. And, and I'm sorry, too, because I was excited because we were going to do that. We we're going to play that music. And then I just realized that YouTube might take it down um, if they found out about it. Okay. Um, and I, you know, we don't want that to happen either. No, uh, for people but to I, use that, I use that music for my own meditation. I use that music <clears throat> all the time when I was um, going to see patients. And uh, just as an example, um, I was working in a pediatric hospice in Virginia, and uh, <clears throat> I would see uh, children, and I would get calls in the middle of the night from mom who would say, you know, Donald is in excruciating pain, can you get here? I, and I'd say, I'm on my way, but it's going to take me 20 minutes. Put on the music. Wow. And because I had used the music every time I was with these children, and they calmed and they, um, you know, they, we reduced their pain. They associated the music with reduced pain. Ah. And they would almost be in this, you know, in a, uh, certainly a, an altered state by the time I got there. That's, that's amazing. You yeah. know, I, if I find, uh, if I find the music on iTunes or something, I will link to it below this video. So oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll do yeah. that. And then, um, all right, so now we get into you're at one with the light, and you're told you have to go back. Um, oh, painful. You, yeah, I imagine. And and in the in the, the you just said you said earlier, and I, I don't think that it, I saw it anywhere else. But you just re let us know that this voice came from the light. It was the light that told you to go yes, back, not some that. other being, right? No, I knew that. Yeah, I, and. I and yet, uh, a little rebel that you are, you questioned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean, it was just, it was, it was such a reaction to say no. 
Um, and you know, I, I I wasn't saying no to my child, no to all of that. I was saying yes to this. I was saying yes to home, yes to love, yes to yeah. oh. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's just you know, you when you're there, you understand that we're eternal beings, and you know, you, so you see the human experience from a very different perspective, yes. that sort of a thing. I know that a lot of people have talked about this same thing who had ch young children, and it's one of the most difficult things that um, I, some of my audience members have tripped over. And, is understanding how could you leave your children behind and right. so i mean i use i mean you covered a little bit at the beginning so but this is basically what it is is seeing the human experience differently and knowing it, that life is eternal and it's not like you're really like you said earlier not leaving them behind it's not no. that situation right no, no it it is why I didn't come back and share my story, though in part I could imagine me telling this story to mothers and they would have banned me from the neighborhood. You know, how, how dare she? You know, she doesn't deserve to be a mother. Yeah, it, when, I was, when I was in the light and say no, I, what I knew is that my child would be okay. My husband would be okay. It's all okay. Yeah. And, um, and also that I wasn't gone from them. Yeah. Yeah. So that there's always that influence, that um, guidance, that love that steers us, you know. And that's I, I think it's so important, uh, the emphasis on this, because because of the depth of it. Because, you know, if you didn't if you weren't leaving anybody, um, you know, in terms of they were going to lose you physically um, and, and and, you know. And then have to live without you physically for a certain amount of period of time. If if you didn't have that, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same message that you have today to tell us about what you know what you just said. You know the the fact that you you're always going to be there. And I mean, do you have the I you know I hear it a million times, but you know that a human life is like the blink of an eye type of a thing. Did you sort of have that perspective um, during this NDE? I, I think I did, and and the and the awareness of how important it is to use this time that we're given. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a blink of an eye, but yes, that 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 knowing that there isn't separation between loved ones. Yeah. Again, that this is this is just an illusion, um, and here on Earth we have the fear, and I think that the fear creates the illusion. Right. You know, and how differently we would live, how differently our experience, different our experience would be here if we didn't have that fear. Yeah, wouldn't it? How, how different our decisions would be, our responses would be if we didn't have that fear. Yeah. 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 No question about it. Uh, I'm not sure it would still be the human experience if we didn't. I mean, I... And, and I think it's one of the one of the reasons having the the human you know the physical experience is so intriguing to souls you know to because they don't experience fear we do mm -hmm. um, and that makes it a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you you know after you've said no a couple of times and, and now you come back and, and, and yeah. the same thing this is you talk about this churning experience like being in a blender mm -hmm. uh it, it sort of reminds me of the old twilight zones you know it's like ah you know you're like <laughs> spinning around <laughs> next thing you know you're in your body uh yeah. any more to say about that or is it just it's very obvious very fast experience film you're back in your body yeah, I was aware that it was a fast experience, and um, again, you know, with limited words, yeah. uh, the best I can put it is feeling as though I was churning. Um, yeah. So it, it was almost the opposite of this beautiful music that I heard in the tunnel uh, to hear, a, you know, almost the sound of a blender coming back. Wow, again, interesting. Again, that may be my interpretation, but it was how I experienced it. Uh -huh. And then you're back in your body, and I mean, what what that was that like because uh where because you had this allergic reaction reaction was there any pain or anything involved or no there was no pain what i what i 
did um, know now was the difference between being uh, without a body and um, being uh, just energy and now being in this body. What happened was I had a real profound new experience of, of um, beyond appreciation, um, but, but a real awareness of how hard it is for us humans to be in this body because it's it's as it's like um, the comparison is like we're walking through mud so it's very it's difficult to to be here it's difficult to do the work it's difficult to be in this body we have limitations here and so there was such a uh, an appreciation for every body no matter what we were working with and um, just a, a profound gratitude for people being here because this is where we do so much work. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, a lot of people are told they have to come back because they have work to do. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. And obviously that means something different for everybody. Did, did you know what that meant or was that something you had to discover? No, I had to discover that when I came back. My reaction was almost, you know, talking to this like, "Well, this better be good." You know? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I suppose a little bit of the rebel in me, but um, this better be good. And and feeling disoriented and um, confused about what in the world that could be, and that I couldn't make that happen. It, yeah. it almost, you know, it wasn't up to me. I, I had to find it, or it had to find me. I don't know, but. But we found each other when I did read that newspaper mm. and the hospice um, story came up to me and I was ah, relieved. And, and I do know um, in one capacity or another, in one venue or another, my work is to um, lower anxiety and fear and to show a, uh, a different way of being with the end of life. I am so grateful, profoundly grateful um, to be invited in to the bedside of people at this um, last time here. Um, it's just a very, very sacred, intimate time and I get to be with them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it's quite and I, and I, and I, you know, it's it's why I wrote the book, hopefully, to change um, the dying person's experience at the end of their life, but also to tell families, loved ones, and professionals that we can make a difference at the end of life. We can do it differently. And some of that is how we bring ourselves to yeah. the bedside and how we open ourselves without fear mm. um, to being of service. And that's where that, you know, I mean, we, so many people fear the death experience and, and therefore want to avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking about other people's, you know, when they're dying, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of relatives and friends disappear. Right. And, and, and this uh, teaches people not how to wrap their minds. This book uh, teaches people how to wrap their minds around what their loved ones are going through in the dying experience so they understand it better. Uh, education and understanding dissipates fear, and but also teaches you uh, the right and wrong ways of helping those people and 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 walking them through it. And of course, I, we talked about this in the last interview, which people can watch below this video. But they, um, you know, you you were able to help your father through his yeah. his dying experience, yeah. which is yeah. a beautiful story. That was a full circle opportunity. So when I couldn't uh, help my mother, when I didn't know what to do, um, and and felt so uh, distraught at not being able to participate with her uh, at the end of her life, I was able to do do that for my father, and it made all the difference in the world to him and to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's such a beautiful story. Just a couple last <laughs> questions about it. So. Through all your experience, you have such amazing experience um, in working in this field. Uh, so how would you say that uh, near-death experiences help us face our own mortality, you know, or that of our loved ones? I mean, you certainly, it's documented in here, not necessarily in reference to the near-death experience, but your wisdom is in there. Uh, and a lot of it 
you know, comes from all your experiences. How would you answer that question, though? Uh, well, first of all, I, I guess I would start by saying it's not my wisdom. It's the wisdom that was shared um, with me um, and from so many um, people who were willing to open themselves and, and talk about their experience. Yeah. But <clears throat> I hope to, I hope that passing on the story of the near-death experience and other people's experience is that you may not have had this experience, but knowing that it's on the map, per se, um, gives you hope and, and is a roadmap to another way of just considering. Let's consider the possibility that death is not uh, painful or um, separating. Let's just consider that. And if we consider it, perhaps we can go in and get closer to it. And by being closer to it, we fully participate, you know, we more fully participate. And when we participate, what we learn is that I can cope and I can make a difference. And it changes the experience. Mm. But the near death experience, the, the best analogy that I have is that, you know, whatever, 300 years ago, we did not know that Tahiti was on the map. And the first explorer who went to Tahiti came back and was ridiculed and disbarred yeah. from the nautical society or whatever. <laughs> but as hundreds and hundreds of people found Tahiti in the same place and described it in similar words and described, you know, how they felt and what happened to them as a result of going to Tahiti. Yeah. Whether you have ever seen Tahiti or not, you know now that it is on the map. Yeah. That's and perhaps right. you, you know, and it can be one, of, it can be your experience too. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, that's beautiful. So when you're in the middle of the snow in Maine. Yeah. You, you can close your eyes and know that there's a different place out there and it too can be yours. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's beautifully said, uh, and, and and it's a great metaphor for life. I mean, you could use that in, in so many different ways. Yes, I love that, and and it's true. And we're and we're certainly not talking about hundreds of people here. We're, no. I mean, I don't even know. Do you know the numbers? Millions, we, millions, millions, millions of people. Of people. And yeah. I know so many of our viewers here on Afterlife TV have said that they've had a near death experience you know? from all over the world. Yeah, and, and many of them, yeah. more than one, more than one, <laughs> one. Yeah, all over the place. It's a shared experience. It's yes. amazing that it's anybody's still questioning it, but that's okay. that's what it is. That's okay uh, if that's what they want to do. Sure. Uh, uh, one last time, your your website is drlonnyleary.com, right? It is. Uh -huh. I got a link to it below. Uh, doctor with D-R, Lonnie Leary, L-A-N-I-L-E-A-R-Y. Um, you can link to that below. We'll have... a. a a link to the music below if we have it the other interview that i did with you anything else you, you want to talk about uh, as far um, as to promote yeah you know i just i want to remind people that your loved ones are not dead they're just in another room and the door is open yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no that that's true uh again i recommend everybody read a book no one has to die alone okay one last look at it there uh sharing your experience with us is just amazing I know a lot of people are going to uh, love it and want to watch it more than once. Uh, grateful to you for, for doing that with us. Thank you so much. And grateful to you. All right. Uh, Thanks. Well, you take care of yourself, Lonnie. Aloha. <laughs> Bye. Bye.